my pleasure to welcome all of you to the University of Miami and its Institute for Advanced Study of the Americas, continuing series of webinars on COVID, um, focusing on the impact of COVID in, in our region, in our hemisphere. And in this case, we are thrilled and honored to be hosting and collaborating with the University of West Indies and its various campuses uh, across um, the Caribbean in, in sharing with you updated information on all different aspects of how this, this disease, of how this virus is impacting health and also the economy and tourism and a series of other factors. Our title today is COVID-19 in the Caribbean, successes, challenges, and opportunities. And I am thrilled to have three amazing speakers with us today, Dr. Clive Landis, Dr. Sanjeev Maharaj, and Dr. Jenny Vremi. I'll give you more detail on them in just a minute. Let me also take a moment, however, to thank our very close collaborator in all of our work with the University of West, the West Indies, with, the, with which the University of Miami is, is very proud and pleased to be able to, to undertake. And that is Ambassador Jillian Bristol, Director of the University of the West Indies Latin American and Caribbean Center. She has been pivotal in all of the work that we've done directly with UWE and also and thanking on behalf of our Hemispheric University Consortium of 14 Universities. She's been an anchor in making that um, happen over the last few years and continues to be so. So we're thrilled to be able to be undertaking this event as part of the Hemispheric University Consortium, as well as part of the work of our university's um, Office for Hemispheric and Global Affairs. And of course, in the context of our observatory of COVID-19 policy in the Americas. And as you know from our previous webinars, we have a website up, we're collecting data in a continual way, and we invite you to have a look at our COVID observatory webinar. Um, in case you are coming in late, um, we will have this uh, fully videoed, and it will be up on our University of Miami Institute for Advanced Study of the Americas website within, we hope, 24 hours, depends a little bit on Zoom, the longest it's taken us is 48 hours ever, so we'll have that very soon. Um, you can follow us and send questions in Spanish or in English, and please use the Q&A feature to send us your thoughts, comments, and of course your questions, um, because we will be answering those once we've heard from our esteemed speakers. Again, you can find this information at uh, the UMIA webpage, which is mia.as.miami.edu. Um, let me now more formally tell you a little bit about our speakers. Um, you can find information again on the website, so I won't waste most of our time on this. Waste in the sense that you can find out a lot about them because um, they are undertaking each of them many very important projects and have an amazing bio that I could read at length, but you can look up. So Dr. Sanjeev Maharaj is the Associate Dean of Distance Education Projects and Planning, Faculty of Medical Sciences, Lecturer and Coordinator in Pharmacy Administration School of Pharmacy at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus. Um, he is also the Associate Dean for Distance Education in ISAD, and his nearly 30 publications in international peer review journals and has presented and attended numerous international conferences. Two of note are the United Nations Congress of Parties 24 in Poland in 2018 as a national delegate and the Health Systems Global Conference in Liverpool 2018, where he won the Pan American Health Organization PAHO scholarship and was the only researcher from the Latin American and Caribbean reason chosen, chosen for oral presentation. In the realm of local public service, Dr. Maharaj served as the Deputy Chairman of the Eastern Regional Health Authority, Chairman of the National Health Services Company, and currently serves as the council, on the Council related to medical professionals and the National Poison Information Center Board. Internationally, Dr. Maharaj serves in the Caribbean Center for Health Systems. Dr. Jean-Yves Remy is, is joined the SRC as deputy director in August 2018. She's an international trade lawyer who over the course of her 15 year career has advised governments and private stakeholders on international trade matters with the focus on dispute settlement under the auspices of the World Trade Organization. 
She has also worked closely with government and private clients to promote and defend their interests in the negotiation of international region and bilateral trade agreements. And through her varied and rich experience has built an international network comprising legal and economic practitioners, academics and negotiators from across the, uh, the globe. Prior to joining the SRC, Jeanneve worked for five years at the office of Sidley Austin LLP in Geneva, Switzerland, where she was a senior trade associate. Arbitration groups on a range of international trade and dispute resolution matters and Janu's representations included matters involving sovereign governments engaged in high profile ongoing disputes at the panel and appellate stages of WTO dispute settlement. Before Sidley Austin LOP, she worked for six years as a legal advisor with the appellate body secretariat of the WTO in Geneva, where she assisted members of the appellate body in their disposition of appeals of trade matters and conducted under the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism. In her earlier career, Jenny has also served as a services trade analyst at the Caribbean Negotiating Machinery, now the Office of Trade Negotiations, where she assisted in coordinating the negotiating positions of Caribbean governments and advised and represented them in multilateral, bilateral, and regional negotiations. She keeps abreast of topics and issues relevant to the Caribbean governments relating to the international law and policy and has been a featured speaker at a number of Caribbean seminars and conference. She's a frequent contributor to the SRC's Trading Thoughts column and the main moderator for SRC's monthly lunchtime chats. She's also deputy director at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus. Now, Dr. Clive Landis, Pro-Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Studies and Chair of the COVID-19 Task Force in the Caribbean at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus as well. He is Professor of Cardiovascular Research and former Director of the Georgia Lane Chronic Diseases Research Center. He leads the Inflammation and Wound Healing Program and is presently seconded to the post of Deputy Principal at Cave Hill campus. Professor Landis is the Honorary Director of the Ministry of Health HIV Laboratory in Barbados, past chairperson of the National HIV AIDS Commission Subcommittee on Research Barbados, past chairperson of the Caribbean Cytometry and Analytics Society, and past associate editor of the Journal of Clinical Cytometry and chair of the UE Regional Task Force on Zika. He received his PhD in immunology in 1990 from Loyola University of Chicago, USA, where he also earned his MSc degree in microbiology. He completed a postgraduate fellowship at the Cancer Center UK before taking up a British Heart Foundation lectureship in cardiovascular medicine in 1997 at Imperial College London. Professor Landis is a molecular and cell biology researcher. He's leading international efforts to redefine the systemic inflammatory response to heart surgery. He also heads national and regional inflammatory initiatives to expand laboratory capacity in the Caribbean. His research include, of course, inflammation, particularly the resolution of inflammation in vascular diseases and recovery from surgery and the expansion of HIV and molecular diagnosis in the Caribbean, and I would also say internationally. And with that, I would like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Maharaj. Hi, and a pleasant good afternoon, and thanks to everyone and for having us this evening to discuss a bit on the status of COVID in the Caribbean and its impact on the healthcare system. And we are coming from, I'm coming from the University of the West Indies St. Augustine Campus Faculty of Medical Sciences. And we have been asked to discuss the overall health ef effects of COVID-19 on the health systems in, in, Trinidad, um, in the Caribbean. Now the Caribbean region actually faces a number of health challenges. And these challenges are very systemic by nature. One, we have a change in demographic profile where we have an increasing aging population and a decreasing birth rate, a changing disease profile with increased NCDs, HIV, zoonotic diseases, a technological issues where the, the lack of technology and technology is not very sophisticated, human resource issues around a lack of nurses, specialists, and so on. Most of these people tend to head out. Policy and infrastructure issues where we have aging health facilities and our policies are very archaic by nature in some cases that don't facilitate uh, growth even within the education realm. Socioeconomic and cultural challenges that have faced us which really looked at us adopting a lifestyle outside of the Caribbean region, which may not have the best impacts on our health. And more recently, we have issues such as climate change, which are impacting significantly on the health outcomes across the Caribbean. And now a lot of studies are coming out on mental health issues 
uh, uh, being affected by that and health inequities. And with that nice pot of diseases and uh, the social determinants impacting upon our healthcare system, COVID-19 was the very nice bomb and timely bomb to fall into the, in, into the uh, realm of the Caribbean. And where does, where does the Caribbean fall in the realm of COVID-19? So as two days ago, when I was preparing this presentation, I took this from the CAFA website. That's the latest figures they got. And within the CAFA member states, we got approximately 56,000 people that are affected by COVID-19. And in the larger Caribbean, taken into consideration both the uh, Dutch speaking, the French speaking, and the Spanish speaking Caribbean, there are about 266,000 uh, cases. And the rest of the world, there are about 54 million cases. But more importantly, uh, the recoveries in the CAFA states were about 43 thousand persons and the deaths were around 1,200. Does that mean anything? When we look at it overall, the infected population percentage uh, for CAFA states is about 0.3%, uh, the Caribbean 0.6%, and the rest of the world, it's about 0.7%. And the number, the percentage of patients that have recovered in the CAFA states are approximately 77%, the Caribbean 65.4%, and the rest of the world hovering around 65% as well, 647 And the percentage of persons who were infected and died were about 2.1% for the CAFA states, the overall Caribbean 1.8, and 2.4 for the rest of the world. Does it say anything? Uh, it, these are just musings here, actually. But it's to give you some perspective. We are actually comparing apples and limes and so on, because not everything is the same. And as we know, not every health system is the same, but it gives us some sort of indicator of what potentially is happening. Are we doing well? Maybe yes, some will say yes. Are we not doing well? Some may say no, because 0.3% of a population has it and you got a higher death rate than persons who has a greater infection rate. So we need to go deeper into these figures, but I won't put too much emphasis on them. But what we can see, from this diagram is that the growth rate of, and this is done by a fantastic work by Ian Hamilton, and this is George Allen Chronic Disease Research Center. He has made this open source, so if anyone wishes to look into it, they can get it online. What we do see here is that the rate currently over the last couple of months, if we look from August to July of growth of COVID-19 in the countries across the curve has somewhat stabilized up to today. And this is up to today, November the 19th. And uh, the daily death rates also has stabilized between one and two for any country across the Caribbean uh, maximum. So there seems to be some level and sub of stability coming around the, the control of COVID-19. But to what extent has this stability and what toll has this taken? Well, a lot of countries had to take mitigation actions and these are around curfews, lockdowns or state of emergencies, some choosing one, some countries such as Belize would have chosen all three curfews, lockdowns and state of emergencies. And that has actually had significant impact on both healthcare delivery and economic impact on these countries. And what, what do we intend to do? So we looked at a research question, how did COVID-19, how did the Caribbean countries perform against the 16 uh, health recommendations by the WHO in their response to COVID-19? And a desktop study was taken during the period of the 1st to the 31st of October, 2020. And we utilized search engines such as Google, Bing, Google Scholar, Scopus, PubMed, the regular culprits, as well as looked at government websites such as the Ministries of Health, CAFA, and the Pan American Health Organization for further data. And what happened, the World Health Organization, I won't dwell or go into all 16 of them here, uh, but they have come up with a framework of these 16 indicators to see how the healthcare system was impacted by COVID. So did the healthcare system expanded capacity for communications? Was there a clear focal point or contact person to develop COVID strategies? There, were there any reviews of the supply chain? And the list goes on. But what I would like to do, given the limited time I have, is look at the successes. So I, I spoke about the challenges. 
I would like to focus on the brighter side. The, the Caribbean has, has been done well in about five of these. And if there's any follow-up, I can well further. But what are some of the things that they have done? So one, in bolstering capacity for essential public health services to enable emergency response. Across majority of the countries, the Caribbean region has been able to increase its ability to implement testing. And this has largely been come through a collaborative effort by the Caribbean Public Health Agency. And I think it's one of the systems that has really worked for us. When it looks at medicine supplies, this was a bit challenging in the early outbreak uh, with China's drugs such as metformin and so on were not easily available due to the APIs and the Caribbean lack of capacity to manufacture APIs and so on. But believe it or not, countries where I live, such as uh, populations in, uh, in Trinidad, there is, a migrant population, major migrant population, a migrant health, which is now a major emerging issue. And now the migrant population is starting to be uh, placed into the, our, our healthcare system. Uh, increased public awareness, this was seen in all of the countries and there's lots of documentation, at least in one regard that there was some increased public awareness. Designated hospitals to receive COVID-19 patients all of the countries that were studied under the 16 had set up some sort of parallel healthcare systems, some going as far as setting up parallel ICU systems to deal with any issues, as well as quarantine systems and step down facilities for patients who would have tested positive for COVID. When we look at organizing and expanding the healthcare services close to home, Trinidad and Tobago can be a good case study actually in the Caribbean because mild, case, mild cases were actually given pulse oximeters monitored twice a day by doctors or medical students to find out what readings are. There were police monitorings to make sure that persons were not leaving their house and primary healthcare facilities within their regions were actually activated as testing sites. So there were over 97 testing sites activated in Trinidad and Tobago over the period of time for persons who had symptoms. So at a localized region, at least we know of one case where this was impact had a but most importantly, and I think the world can learn from this, the Caribbean was able to mobilize, although the, uh, George Jacques Boudot said, sons of a fat and fertile soil are weak and infeminate by nature, while those of a lesser are creative, innovative, and eternally vigilant. And we were eternally vigilant when it came to human resources. We, it's one time that the Pan American Health Organization did a study of health human resources. And what were some of the things that the Caribbean people did? One, they rehired retired healthcare workers. They agreed with private sector to engage the private sector into the, into the healthcare system. They actually contracted new healthcare personnel, worked with other countries such as Cuba to increase their healthcare personnel load. They expanded the roles of healthcare personnel. So for example, pharmacists were looked at changing their roles in, in, in some of the Caribbean countries and actually taking early symptoms. Uh, task sharing was, was done task shifting, which was important because they actually allowed persons from the other, uh, what we call the management side to get involved in the overall management of the parallel health healthcare system. And also reorganization of shifts. There was uh, to ensure that we have a very healthy workforce and ensure the relevant social distancing taking place. And this was found in numerous countries across the Caribbean. And to ensure that we kept the social fabric in place and there was no hardship, there were countries had come up with deferred loan payments program, small business loans to keep small businesses running, grants for rental and food supplies for the general population and tax waivers in some cases across the Caribbean. Now, at the end of the day, there's significant opportunity. One, there's opportunity with the vaccine that is coming out. The Caribbean region has been one of the regions that continues to have a high success rate, especially with, with areas such as malaria and vaccination. They have been a protocol. And if we look there, I think this is one area they can have some, some great continue along that track. Two, planetary health, my area, I must speak a bit about it. This is a time where every dollar invested in the Caribbean needs to take a health in all policies approach look and see where we can mitigate and derive co-benefits for areas such as climate change, 
NCDs, all of these things, they are the interlinks and the co-benefits can be derived. And we need to look at those opportunities when we get those dollars for reconstructing and redeveloping the economy. I'm not an economist. That will be spoken to a little later on by my colleague. And this is a time for us to sophisticate. This is a time for us to change the way in which we do uh, medicine, move towards telehealth. We can look at forward triaging, electronic intensive ICU units. And at the end of the day, this is the time that we need to embrace technology to move us out and move us forward into the next realm. So if you guys have a look at our St. Augustine campus, this is our current normal. It's no longer a new normal, it's the current normal. And we eventually hope to, and the salmon trees are indicative of our St. Augustine campus. And I wish to leave with these words, COVID-19 actually offers immense opportunity to change the Caribbean positively, but we must be able to innovate, create, and be eternally vigilant in the mechanisms that we put in place to ensure that we are successful and come out of COVID-19. That's the end of my talk, thank you. I hope I'm under 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Sandeep. It was absolutely perfect. And let me now turn the microphone over to uh, Jenny. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you uh, to the organizers for this opportunity uh, to present the other side of the lives and livelihood coin in a sense. And it's a perfect opportunity and follow up to Dr. Maharaj. I'm not an economist either. <laughs> I don't claim that I'm a lawyer. Um, but in my capacity as a deputy director here uh, for a trade center, um, I have relied a lot on some of the co-authors of a paper of a policy document. It's actually going to be available. It's available on our website and I'll try to plug it into the chat function that really represents some of the trade and economic responses that the Caribbean has had to the COVID uh, pandemic. And we call it trading our way to recovery during COVID-19 because the economic and trade consequences um, of COVID are not over and they will probably be with us for quite a while. So I'm going to start actually with sharing my screen um, um, to show you a few statistics um, uh, about COVID um, and its impact on the e some of the economic systems that are of importance to us and really look at it uh, primarily and starting from a trade perspective. And then I will turn to some of the, the thinking and the reflections that we had um, coming out of um, our analysis of some of the trends that we're seeing. So just to show you the overall impact of COVID on world trade. Um, and you know the estimation is that um, it will fall by 4.8% in 2020 with a slight rise in 4.9%. Um, but its overall merchandise trade by the WTO statistics is expected to fall by 9.2%. Um, now, this is really important in terms of statistics because one of the things, unlike in the health uh, department that I can see Dr. Maharaj was able to present quite conclusively, is we still don't have very Caribbean specific data that allows us to provide that kind of trajectory and analysis of economic forecast. But we, we do what we can by surveying um, the, the sources that we, we, we readily have available to us. So also just to give you a broad sense of what's happening economically worldwide, you'll see from the graph here that which country is actually doing or, or you know, plotting its way out of the demise of exports is really China. And that is because of its, 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 its uh, preponderance in terms of the world market in creating things like face masks and these other kind of PPEs in response to COVID. Um, some of the other economies have managed um, not to rebound as impressively as China, but, um, and some of really of them are really stuck at the bottom there. Um, in terms of the sectoral impact, um, what we're finding um, when we look at the, the statistics globally, sorry, is that um, the, actually the United States, and we're focusing on the United States because this is a, a University of Miami, um, so forum, we noticed that in the PPE, medical products department, again, um, we found that imports into the US went down and exports went up. Um, China actually by April this year 
its exports as well as its imports, if particularly its exports really, really went through the roof. Um, the sectors that are actually affected, um, bad news for tourism and trade related um, airlines, uh, automobile, oil and gas drilling. And when I talk about the impact on the Caribbean, this will be really important, but globally what we're seeing is the good news for certain sectors that on the on the rise insurance healthcare and pharma telecommunications video streaming and the tech industry not very surprising um again this is a view of the situation in the united states uh the tr trade deficit as a result of covid or or you know has definitely gone up as you see from the middle graph there the figures show that the, the increase in definite uh, in deficit is quite pronounced um now, turning to the Caribbean, which I, I know you're more interested in, and thinking about the Caribbean's response juxtaposed against the global um, responses, we are seeing COVID hit at a time, and I think uh, my priest, the speaker before me, was also talking about this. It, it struck at a time when we're seeing unsustainable debt levels in the Caribbean, weak economic growth, persistent account deficits, and any of the economists in the region will talk about you, our limited diversity and competitiveness. Um, our export and import merchandise is still very much uh, trade, it's very much concentrated with the United States, um, as you will see from this figure, both in terms of imports as well as exports. And that's, that's represented by that sort of 45 and 24% figure in the pie chart. Now, how have the Caribbean uh, trade-related responses been featured? One of the things that we tracked was, well, how did the United States react vis-a-vis um, -vis Caribbean countries? Uh, we had a few instances pursuant to signing of the Defense Production Act by the former president, or, um, uh, Trump, to bar the export of certain key um, products to the region, including ventilators that were donated by uh, Rihanna. It was later resolved as were some of the export restrictions to the Bahamas and the Cayman Islands of medical supplies, again, solved through diplomatic channels. But the knee-jerk reaction of all countries, and not just the United States, but certainly us being a neighbor to the United States, we had benefited from some kind of lenience, uh, leniency, was that countries really retracted and they contracted their exports um, to the negative impact of some of our economies. And within our own sectors, um, how have we reacted? Well, in some cases, we have um, imposed or, or removed, sorry, um, duties on importation and the importation of key supplies, including medical supplies and relief supplies, as well as VATs um, have gone away, and including things like hand sanitizers, um, disinfectant wipes, etc. Um, and seeing, you know, that push to ensure that there were no restrictions to some of these key, key uh, supplies to our economies during COVID. Um, now, on the other side, we also saw some elements of trade restrictiveness. So the Bahamas, for instance, in order to, uh, you know, protect its domestic manufacturing industry of masks, um, we saw a temporary prohibition on importation of these face masks. Um, so, you know, the tendency of protectionism was not um, lost to some of these Caribbean islands. And recently, we also heard the Jamaican government suspending agricultural imports of products to help mitigate farmers' losses. So now I really want to talk about the some of the things we unearthed in our report. Um, and this is really going to be the bulk of my presentation. Um, what did we uncover? What was uncovered for the region coming out of the pandemic? And we did not want to just have in our report a knee-jerk reaction. We wanted to look instead at some of the structural issues that we feel are stymieing the full realization of the Caribbean single market and economy. For those who don't know what that is, it's really the framework within the legal provisions of the Caribbean Treaty that are supposed to drive economic integration of the Caribbean. And the first thing that we looked at was sort of the industrial policy. How did COVID implicate or show up the industrial policy or the economic development blueprint that the Caribbean has chosen for itself? Now, for a long time, we've known that we have monosectoral import and FDI, foreign direct investment, reliant economies, and very little innovative prospects. And this was shown to us 
very, very clearly by COVID. Dependence on foreign direct investment in the region comes at the expense of local and regional investment. And it'll have to be reconsidered post COVID because FDI globally is expected to shrink by 30 to 40%. Um, the pandemic also paralyzed the region's productive sectors. We are seeing oil exports be on the decline as well as prices. Service-based economies, tourism, or the region's bread and butter continues even today to bear the brunt of the COVID-19 impact. And small businesses, which account for over 70% of enterprises and 50% of the region's employment, continue to struggle due to their limited access to financial resources. Um, we saw Caribbean governments have these stimulus packages, not of the order of the United States, obviously, where you could actually subsidize production at huge rates, but we were able to provide some economic stimulus packages comprising fiscal incentives, injection into impacted sectors. Um, but overall, we don't know what the shift in the industrial policy of the region is going to be. And I'll have something to say in terms of recommendations moving forward. The second major area that everybody speaks about now is our region's food security, or rather insecurity. Caribbean economies were born out of historical monocrop uh, plantation economies. And in recent years, due to global economic patterns and trade rules, the region's agricultural sector has diminished, accounting now for between 7 and 17% of our GDP. But of course, any region needs an agricultural base in order to ensure its existential survival. And the lesson was hit home during COVID. Um, what we did uncover was that global prices um, relatively remain stable. There were no major disruptions to food production in the sense that we were not able to feed our population. However, the lesson was too close to home, and experts warned that poverty and food security could dramatically increase, especially as we're now witnessing a second phase in the lockdown. The region has a huge food reliance, um, accounting for over US $5 billion a year when measured in 2019. And so the levels of expenditure that we spend purchasing food erode foreign exchange bases of member states and diverts funds away from conducive factors of production. Anecdotally, we also witnessed the impact on reliance on export markets and not regional markets. For instance, we saw fishing industry and fishing going to waste because we could not access export markets. Um, now, the Caribbean ministers assure us that we have adequate food supply levels. But again, as I said, you know, the linkages between our food production and tourism meant that most of our food, a lot of our food that previously was going to hotels and restaurants and not to feed local, local persons meant that some of, some of that was just because of weak uh, linkages, some of that was just put to waste. Now, the, another sector that I wanted to look at and we looked at in the report is e-commerce. Now, there's a mixed kind of view here and I think there is so much reason for optimism. Um, the pandemic reveals some inadequacies. It reveals that government services conducted face to face at a huge inconvenience could no longer be tolerated. So digital transformation schemes have ramped up as a result of, the, of, of COVID. We noticed uneven levels of interconnectivity and broadband access. We noticed also the shortcomings of our regulatory and legislative infrastructure, the lack of indigenous and regional digital payment systems that would move us away from expensive third party payment platforms. All of these prerequisites to moving our economy online um, was necessary, and even more strictly related to trade, electronic windows, single windows, risk assessments done online in order to expedite customs procedures with things um, that were actually brought to the fore. So we also witnessed, however, the emergence of our nascent tech community, I would call it, which showed creative solutions. And this even includes 
our regional central banks that are moving to digital currencies like the Eastern Caribbean and sand dollar in the Bahamas. We looked also at um, you know, a lot of companies moving their brick and mortar operations online. And for those of you who watch Versus and saw Beanie Man and Bounty Killer um, going head to, head to head on these online platforms, these are new opportunities for some of these original like in-face and in-person con um, concerts. I don't have much time left, but I want to use the remaining two minutes I have to wrap up my thoughts on where the opportunities laced with some challenges lie. And the first has to be reclaiming our industrial policy because that sets the umbrella tone for the rest of the government led and enabling uh, economic environment. The first thing has to be for us to think about developing local and regional productive capacity in tandem with pursuing export markets. Outside of the food, um, sector, which I mentioned before, we need to think about also um, developing our medical responses. So medical equipment, we saw some great ideas coming out of UWE um, with medical ventilators and alcohol and hand sanitizers that were re repurposed from our regional rum distilleries. Um, but we can't think about these short-sighted solutions. We have to think about moving to greener pastures and blue economy. Um, in order to take our economies out of chronic debt and think of viable new sectors uh, anew, but also think of linking our tourism sector with some of these new potentials. And I recently heard the Prime Minister from Barbados, the Honorable Mia Motley, talk about a green recovery effort linked to the tourism product, where they would come out after COVID fitter and better, moving to 100% renewable energy setting up a green investment plan, um, food and drink supply chains from rainwater, using and restoring agricultural lands to production and helping the farmers invest in new technologies. And government cannot do this alone. We are encouraged by actions such as Huawei that has invested in the University of the West Indies Innovation Lab. So it's also the private sector and institutions to work collaboratively on innovative new ideas. And finally, I want to say, because like Dr. Maharaj, and I have many more ideas that are reflected in our paper, we have to learn to leverage our trade agreements more effectively, including our own, which is the revised treaty of Chagaram and the sets of CARICOM. And I want to actually stop on, on, on something that was encouraging to me that is considered the no-go zone or the holy cow of trade, that you can't touch the free movement of persons what we saw happen with Ghanaian nurses from Africa and Cuban doctors and nurses from, from Cuba basically shows us that moving people, which some have said really represents the new terrain for our regional integration process, is possible. It's possible when we, we have the political will to do it. And so I think you know the idea of leveraging these are trade agreements by ensuring that you can supply our service, the, the, the needed services with persons within the region, but also outside of the region through a regulated sort of demand and supply kind of uh, mechanism is something that we can look to in the future. Thank you so much for the time and I welcome any questions or comments. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Janine. That was amazing. Let me just recall for our audience that you can send in questions and thoughts and comments, please, preferably questions. We need those for the Q&A session. And please feel free to send those in Spanish or in English. We are managing simultaneous translation. Um, let me now turn this over to Dr. Landis. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, uh, Chair, and I also welcome the opportunity to participate in this forum with the Institute for Advanced Study of the Americas. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to um, show just three slides, which uh, were prompted by what I heard from Sandeep and from uh, Janeve. Uh, so. Okay, uh, can you see my slide? I'm presuming that's a yes. Um, so, that's okay. Um, 
statistics are very interesting. Um, so that's why it's always very important to put the source of what you're showing um, on your slide. So I went to the um, Our World in Data uh, website, which uses information collected daily by the European CDC. And um, for your listeners, I just wanted to paint a picture of how the Caribbean is doing compared to its neighbors to the north and to the south. Um, and it's sometimes quite difficult to get data for the Caribbean. Not all Caribbean countries report all, all their data. Some of them are extremely small. Um, and it's, it's never really represented in global data as a region. So you have to kind of cobble it together yourself. So um, I think, as you know, uh, in terms of cases, um, per country, that depends very much on testing capacity. And although the testing capacity is actually very good for most Caribbean countries, it's not, it's not um, uh, 100% uh, for all of them. So what is considered a slightly more reliable measure is actually deaths per um, standard population size. So deaths per million is, is reported by the ECDC. And so uh, America, um, uh, the United States, uh, and South America as a region have uh, around about uh, just over 700 deaths uh, per, per million. Um, you can see that the EU and the Canada are somewhere in the middle with 453 for the EU and 283 per million uh, for Canada. So only really the Bahamas has struggled and is at 392 uh, deaths per, per million. What you can see here is that most of the Caribbean countries did not really have an outbreak in the first wave, and they've been able to defer whatever outbreaks there have been until quite a bit later. Only the Dominican Republic um, had quite an early outbreak. Um, so if you actually start with the three largest countries in the Caribbean in terms of population size, so Cuba's the largest, uh, they've uh, only had um, 7,000 cases and 130 deaths. So obviously they've done very well. They have a very strong public health system. Um, Haiti uh, had its outbreak over the summer and is now very quiet. Um, so, so Haiti um, uh, has around about uh, 10,000 uh, cases and uh, uh, I think they have around uh, 700 deaths. So, so, you know, again, for a large country, um, uh, it works out at uh, 21 um, uh, deaths per million, uh, cumulatively. Um, and then the Dominican Republic, as mentioned, had 209 uh, deaths per million. But the other countries, um, uh, Trinidad, Jamaica, um, Barbados, um, I didn't really have enough space to put in um, Antigua, um, uh, other countries like, um, Grenada, Dominica, Anguilla, um, St. Kitts and Nevis, and St. Vincent, they all have zero deaths. They're not even on this chart. So when I look at the whole region and I look at deaths per million, the Caribbean has about a tenth of what is seen uh, in the US or in South America uh, per standard population size. But that relatively good performance in terms of public health is not reflected in GDP because of our extreme exposure. Um, uh, and we're not very diversified our economies. Most of them are highly dependent on tourism, which has just collapsed. And so uh, the majority of Caribbean countries um, would have double digit um, projected GDP uh, contractions this year. Whereas the GDP contractions in the US in South America would be somewhere between four to eight percent. So, so clearly much, much better. So you've got these extremes. Yes, we've done well public health perspective, but no, in terms of economic um, contraction, we've been hit very hard. Um, and then, um, uh, then Sandeep sort of triggered something in my mind about the vaccine that's going to come to our rescue. Uh, or is it? Because even if we have a, a successful vaccine, what about if people don't want to take it? And uh, so this is just some data um, done in the US. And I've seen some survey data in the Caribbean, which is relatively similar to this, where roughly 60% uh, of the population is comfortable in taking a vaccine and they would take it. In this diagram, they're represented, which has to do with social media engagement, they're represented in blue. 
about 30% of people are looking for more information. They're a little bit, mm, you know, maybe, maybe not. So in this diagram, you can see they're very active on social media. 10% in the US are saying, no, I will not take a vaccine. And no means no, I really mean it. And, and they're shown in red here. And they're actually highly active on social media and are entangled in this whole discussion about vaccines. So I think it's very important for people like me um, uh, who are in the medical field, just to sort of remind people in case they've forgotten uh, what vaccines have achieved. So of course, um, smallpox um, was eradicated in, in 1980. There will never be ever a need again to vaccinate anyone for smallpox because the disease has been eradicated. And just in the 20th century alone, uh, there were 300 million deaths due to smallpox. Of course, measles was eliminated in the US, but now there's a resurgence because of the vaccine hesitancy. Um, and of course, TB continues to be a huge killer. Um, and so, you know, uh, despite the fact that this vaccine's been around and it's been safe for over 100 years, uh, we, we still have uh, 1.5 million deaths uh, in 2018. But the good news is that vaccines saved 58 million lives from TB in the 21st century alone. And then, of course, polio, you know, what a scourge and a terror that was um, in a childhood disease causing paralysis. So in, uh, I, in um, 1988, uh, I, I can't see all of my screen, I'm just trying to recall, there were 350,000 paralysis cases, and there's only 38 of those left. So there's only two countries where polio is still uh, circulating. So just in case people didn't have any questions, I'm going to leave it there um, because I'm sure that would have stimulated lots of questions vaccines always do. And you know how they say that um, you should always put behind you a book that you have? Well, I wrote a book, but it's an e-book and it's free. So I can't really uh, tout it um, uh, except just to say um, uh, this is the e-book that I've written on um, ethical decision making during COVID. Thank you. That was that was wonderful. Thank you very much, especially that green, red, and blue. I was thinking we could probably make it into a painting as well as what it's actually recommending. It's that visual representation of data that, that's so impressive, um, but of course tells us so much about what we need to think about in terms of um, naysaying of, of the use of vaccines and what that's going to mean for our world um, overall and how we have to make sure that there's a whole other next stage of public health education work. Um, once we do have that vaccine in place, it's not just the economics. And by the way, just to show, I actually am an economist. So we do have an economist here for those who have economics questions. Um, and uh, so, and to introduce more properly, I'm Felicia All, and I am an economist. Um, as well as leading um, the Institute and the Office for Hemispheric and Global Affairs. So I do help economics research when I have time to do so. Um, again, let me thank all of our panelists and let me see if we've gotten any questions on the chat. And if not, I have a few. Um, so we have not gotten any questions yet on our, our chat, but we do have some of the Q&A on this story. So um, Morgan Gianola is asking, how might debt forgiveness programs across nations help mitigate the economic impact of shutdowns resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic? And how might we, I guess, pursue or promote um, debt forgiveness? Any thoughts on that from our group? I, uh, I can start off um, because this is such a, a huge advocacy point coming out of the Caribbean region. And if you look at any of the recent CARICOM, so I mean, I imagine most of your listeners would know CARICOM, it's the Caribbean community and it's head, but it's a governmental organization that is really based on a treaty um, that sets up a sort of a, a direction for the Caribbean region to go that's underpinned by really economic um, um, rationale. So, you know, creating this, this regional space, like any you know, free trade agreement or customs union, that really allows for the efficient allocation of resources across um, disparate countries, but really creating a common economic space. 
and it's headed by really governments um, of the region. And so they've been meeting really a, a lot since COVID in all spheres of their competence. Um, and one of the recent decisions that came out of the, um, the heads of the government, the heads of government, is to really focus on um, a transformation of the Caribbean economies. And one of the things that saddles the economy is debt, chronic, chronic debt that is only exacerbated by these natural disasters that every year come and visit us. Um, now, the answer to that is debt forgiveness. Debt forgiveness, access to concessional loans, which means that, you know, unfavorable terms that are not necessarily dictated by market forces. Um, and certain countries, usually least developed countries, as well as countries that are nominated or denominated by international financial and development um, organizations like the World Bank and the IMF, have agreed to forgive, not forgive in terms of wipe out the loans, but delay. Um, or allow for the delay of the re re repayment of loans. Because many of our Caribbean islands are, um, have high or medium key GDP per capita, we don't get access to these facilities. And so the problem is that for our countries that are saddled by COVID and are blacklisted and have very few streams of income now that the tourism sector is completely decimated, we really don't have that outlet. And so one of the lobbying and calls and advocacy calls is for move from GDP per capita, which cripples some of our countries in terms of access to development finance, and move instead to a vulnerability index. So look at a country's ability to react and respond to exogenous shocks like the pandemic um, or like natural disasters. And so I know this weekend, the G20 is meeting to talk about uh, thinking of this DSSI program, is what I understand, and thinking really of, um, you know, how do they deal with the saddling debt of countries, not just small countries, but Brazil, all of these other uh, transition and emerging markets are also dealing with it. So it's a broader conversation. It, I'm, I'm sorry you started me off, but it's really something that has to be pursued um, really collectively as our region, because the debt numbers I gave you were just out of the out just out of whack and it really cripples us because it means you're sat you're repaying a debt which trickles down to the private sector and access to commercial loans and you still have to survive you you're you're, you're servicing a debt and you have to move your economies in new directions so that in a nutshell is the answer but I don't know if anybody else wanted to jump in let me know that was that was amazing and also you touched on advocacy and I want to get back to that because we've had some other questions sent to me that focus on that but I want to just go through these initial round of questions and Mario Fidalgo um, Clive is asking a very interesting question to what extent is the COVID-19 data for Haiti reliable do you know anything more detailed about testing coverage there that may impact these extremely low figures, especially since they share an island with the Dominican Republic, but the worst first wave in the Caribbean and the intensity of circulation between Haiti and the DR and returns deportation since the onset of COVID-19 could be a major factor. Yeah, so the uh, testing capacity per capita in Haiti is very low. And that is exactly why I chose to uh, present uh, COVID-19 deaths. Um, so uh, uh, COVID-19 related deaths, um, uh, because of the WHO um, diagnostic criteria, and also um, they would be prioritized um, for uh, uh, testing, those would be considered more reliable. Certainly their testing capacity is extremely low. Um, I also have quite a lot of colleagues in, in Haiti and the phenomenon that was observed there seems to be quite similar to what's been observed and has slightly puzzled people, but it's been very consistent. So in, in refugee camps, in very poor settings like Yemen and also Haiti, the death rate has been very low. And this has been seen again and again. And, and some people are thinking that we are maybe in these very crowded settings, there's a lot of um, uh, infectious diseases circulating and they're providing some kind of co-protection against COVID-19. The other factor is that um, when you look at the uh, population curve of Haiti, it's, it's a, a much younger population. And of course, younger people are less affected in terms of death 
than uh, older ones. But um, uh, uh, when I speak to people on the ground um, in the various uh, organizations in Haiti, the, the low death rate is uh, certainly believable. It's, it's, it's not in some way um, uh, out of whack. Um, I, I hope that answers um, uh, that interesting question. I am sure it does. And I think I'm very happy that we are beginning to discuss and think about how to support in many ways, the poorest country of our region, which is Haiti. And we should you know, think about probably doing a webinar in the future specifically on Haiti um, and, uh, and how to be supported because we're not touching on other issues um, that Geneva touched on for the Caribbean overall, things like food security, which I'm sure is a major, major source of concern. And also um, I think when we're thinking about Haiti, we need to really think of the syndemic focus here. It's, it's layers of pandemics. So in addition to looking at COVID-19, what are we going to see in terms of excess deaths, disability and cases suffering from other, other diseases as a result of all that is happening in, in our world. Um, we have another interesting question, I think, um, from Michael Maloney for Dr. Remy. And Michael asks, can you say more about the rum industry and how it shifted its production or shared resources to support the healthcare effort or industry? Is that, I, I'm not sure if I'm putting you on the spot or if that's a, that's a great and interesting question, but I thought it was certainly added a little bit of spice to our discussion. Certainly spice, and I mean, I, I give all credit to the amazing researchers from my team um, that really tracked down all sorts of anecdotal, um, you know, sort of evidence, stuff in newspapers that we saw. So these are just Chelsea Brathwaite and Alicia Nichols, who I think are on the call. Um, and so the, the idea is that I don't know much more about it. I think it was maybe in Barbados, it might be in Jamaica, but what we, what we, we, we heard about was that at least temporarily. I mean, some of the rum we produce in the region, you know, <laughs> you know, it can knock you out, if, you know, if it's not diluted. So maybe there didn't have to be too much of a change in consistency. I joke, I kid, we have the best rum in the world. Um, but the truth is that, you know, in that time when exports were probably, um, you know, sky need, why not use the productive capacity that's just laying idle there and repurpose it to something that's health related. So. I, I don't know much more about no. it, but that would certainly be something I could look up more and see what has maybe, happened since. Maybe I could come in as well. Um, so yes, the production was turned over uh, in Barbados to the, the creation of hand sanitizers because there was a complete run on, on anything uh, alcohol-based, any alcohol-based products. Um, and so they have been providing hand sanitizers uh, for the region. Um, I should also say that um, the oldest um, rum distillery in the world, which is called Mount Gay, um, that has actually been purchased a few years ago by Remy Cointreau. And because of the uh, great reach of Remy Cointreau, uh, Mount Gay is now found all over the world. Whereas these wonderful rums that um, uh, Janine mentions, they used to be in the Caribbean and nowhere else, but, but certainly Mount Gay is now, is now everywhere. And, and it was similar in Trinidad with Angostura because of the, the limited amounts of alcohol-based products available, they repurposed and we had hand sanitizers around and actually they gave it out free for a period of time. Yeah. So this is of course very interesting on the policy front side because um, you know some countries decided that uh, the distribution of alcohol was an essential service. And others decided that the distribution of alcohol was something that had to be shut down because of the lockdowns and, for example, risks of violence. And there's a lot of variation around the world. My home country, Canada, I think decided it was an essential service. Um, also happens to be something that is a major source of income for the government. But since I believe strongly yeah. in being Canadian in my government, um, I think they took a, a good middle road. But this has been, this has been a major concern and a, a major issue. Um, in, in, in violence um, and concerns about violence during the lockdown. So, you know, all kidding aside, I think this is, is a very important subject is that how um, production of alcohol, which is the legal substance um, that can be managed in most countries has or has not been managed. And so that's extremely interesting. We have a series of additional questions. So one of um, the, our leading um, professors from and scientists from 
the University of Miami, Sylvia Donert, is asking, what advantages could the strong health response have for economic reactivation in the Caribbean? And will those sorts of advantages disappear once a vaccine is, is available? Um, maybe I would have a stab at that. So, um, yes, I think that the strong um, health responses and the building of capacity, um, it, uh, it creates what I would call a COVID competency dividend. If you are in the tourism sector, you're competing with the rest of the world, not just between Caribbean countries, you're competing with the world. And I think people have taken note that the Caribbean is a safe destination. Many of the countries are still have no deaths um, and you know, would be in these green corridors that, that's, let's say, the UK has, has set up. And we also see that- There's Something seems to have happened with the microphone. Maybe it's, it's touching something. Uh, sorry, uh, let me- Oh, perfect, much better. Yeah, we got okay. the dividend. Yes, um, and so um, we have now invested in capacity, for example, uh, additional capacity that we never used to have in, in making isolation centers. Um, and this is very useful, for example, when you have, um, let's say the cruise ship that ended up, um, uh, which started cruising and ended up with seven cases in the St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It came to Barbados because Barbados has a state-of-the-art isolation center. Um, and so, you know, the cruise industry would then tend to gravitate towards places which are set up uh, to have, um, you know, strong testing, uh, strong isolation facilities and things like that. Um, and I do think they will survive the, the rediscovery of tourism once vaccines become available that should free up tourism. But I think people will remember, the, the cruise ships will certainly remember Barbados because, um, I think we ended up at one point with 11 cruise ships all parked outside of Barbados. And it was the repatriation of all their crews, which were just stuck on there. And, and countries, you know, were not set up to um, bring those persons safely through and be able to repatriate them home. Um, so I think the cruise industries um, uh, will certainly um, uh, come to those countries which, which um, do have that new health infrastructure. If I may, Dr. Knoll, just to follow up on, on that thought, which is that the really innovative and creative economies in the Caribbean, and, and, and there are a few, are in a time when everybody accepts it's a difficult time, people are losing their lives, people's um, jobs are being lost. Th there's an opportunity there. And I live in a jurisdiction, the, uh, Barbados, where the welcome stamp, and I understand Antigua and Barbuda has something similar, which is there's an opportunity there for persons who come, usually people who come, the tourism that we usually have is cruise tourism or short stay tourism. So people come and they leave and some of them make Barbados their holiday destination. But the idea of this 12 month welcome stamp, you can come to this part of the world and they've developed out the administrative and the business case for it. So the people who come have access to information and all of that it becomes your, your home away from home. And at a time when there's so much, you know, so, so, so much misery in the world to come to a region and to come to an island that is safe, very well um, you're regarded in terms of its, its, its health um, treatment and, and treatment of the disease, it's going to lead to investment in all sorts of, you know, related industries, so real estate, um, you know, people coming here and setting up shop eventually. So I think, you know, as, as much as, as the misery across the islands, um, across the world is, is a point, an inflection point, it's also an inflection point that allows us to pivot and think really much more creatively about our sun and sea and sand in ways that will lead to, to growth of our economies in the longer term. So I agree with you completely that the management and handling of the, the cruises and the cruise ships will forever linger in the minds of persons who are on these ships and these, these cruise um, you know, businesses because dealing with people in that way um, during a time of crisis will, 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 will resonate with people and hopefully the Caribbean will be a place where people come and feel that they've been taken care of during a time when the world just its lights went out. So that's an advertisement again for the region. <laughs> you know, okay. uh, Chairman, could I... Um... 
Let's make one one slightly differential view. Um, but can you both call me Felicia? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Yeah. So, so I have a slightly different different view on, on the matter. Um, I agree that that a lot of these things will necessitate a level of interaction. But more importantly, what happens is the sophistication of our financial systems. Now I'm putting on my business hat, right? Um, uh, um, uh, is, is, is what will be one of the, the downfalls that, that will not necessarily allow this thing to, to be catalyzed and move very quickly. You see, what, what tends to happen, our, our financial sector continues to be very much, you know, not, not very savvy, and we still utilize a lot of old technology. And countries like Trinidad, which I think has one of the most sophisticated um, financial sectors across the Caribbean, only 20% of the people actually carry digital credit cards, right? Um, and, and that's not taken into consideration persons who has two credit cards. So even to get on a digital platform to play on that and to take advantage of some of these things to bring people in and to make them spend and, and, and put money on the frills, that is one of the things that will really um, give us a, a little disadvantage. And if we don't reform that quickly and sufficiently, we will we'll have some problems going down the road. So let me just say, after I've had a, a decades, um, very blessed decades of working and being um, interacting with the Caribbean in my life. And so I completely understand and hear that the pride and the love of country and place that each of you are sharing with our world. I think that the idea of a COVID competency dividend is, is extremely interesting. Um, but also what I'm hearing you say is that a, a small island nation did a global public good. And that global public good is something that the world needs to hear about um, in terms of uh, the tourism industry, but particularly the ships that had to use the hospital systems and the support. And if I'm not wrong, many of those systems, those hospital systems are actually part of the University of the West Indies. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Um, so this, this is a, a global debt um, to the Caribbean and to the University of the West Indies going back to the debt idea. So it's, it's another reason why um, we would think about debt relief because the world holds a debt in many senses and in the future, as many, many people around the world are looking for safe places uh, to be able to get a little, what did you say, how did you put it? Um, sand, sun, and sky, um, and, but truly a, a little bit of, of relief from what have, has been um, many, many, many months of, of hardship and pain. So I understand those plugs and I completely agree. Um, now we still have questions and I'm very pleased we still have a little bit of time. Um, we have one from, let's see, there are quite a few actually. So this is it's a harder one. This is Luis del Solari saying, why, why are the reasons, um, what, how could we could explain the very different levels of contagion and deaths in the Caribbean compared with other parts of, um, with, he says South America, but I would say um, include Mexico and, and, and Central yeah, America there. I'd be happy to take that one. Um, so I think it really, I would sum it up uh, in that the Caribbean did basics well. And so the backbone of any response in COVID-19 is your testing capacity. Now, um, our laboratories have been building viral testing capacity bit by bit, uh, mostly due to the HIV epidemic for the last 30 years. And they've been building it, building it. And then we were challenged in 2013 with chikungunya. And, and that led to further extension of viral testing capacity. Then we were challenged again with Zika. And again, it led th that actually led to the university's testing system being integrated into the national systems. And then when, when um, uh, uh, COVID-19 hit, suddenly we were ready. We had all the labs in place. We have a referral system for those countries, very, very small countries that might not have any labs. And when you look at the testing, they're all using the WHO, the German um, gold standard PCR test. And our turnaround times are on average 24 hours or less, or less. 
and that enables you to do contact tracing and isolation. When you have turnaround times, which unfortunately happened in, in other more developed countries of you know four, four days, five days, six days, you lose control of the epidemic. And of course, in the US, um, they really started on the back foot because the CDC test, um, it, it didn't work at the beginning of the epidemic um, in February when it was really desperately needed. And when the, the kit was eventually revised, um, you know, by then the epidemic had already taken root. So I think, you know, that testing, con um, uh, contact tracing, which of course in a small island you can do, and isolation really work. The second point is the early shutdowns. We're island economies. So apart from countries that share land borders, like someone mentioned Haiti with DR, and let's say Suriname with Brazil, um, Belize with Mexico, you know, those are the only countries with, with long land borders. The others are islands, and you can close them down very quickly. And most countries close their borders before one death, and some countries close their borders before one case. And so I think, you know, we were able to make use of the fact that we're an island archipelago to really get on top of this um, uh, first wave. So I would love to just build on that for a minute and uh, I'll let someone else share. Um, as I'll just switch over for a second and take the mic. You know, our, our COVID observatory in the Americas, which is a subnational COVID observatory, which is not necessarily what's required for the Caribbean, but for many other countries, uh, particularly, but not only the larger ones of Brazil and Mexico, we, we did this um, very much for a reason. So to build on, on what, what Clive said, um, this idea of testing and contact tracing being the backbone. You know, we unfortunately, very unfortunately, have several countries in the region, but probably the one that pains me to highlight because it's the country that I call home is Mexico, is still at extremely low levels of testing um, across the country and not focusing on that. And without that, it is very difficult to have any kind of a policy of containment. And of course we are seeing climate doesn't help, but um, climate controlled, shall we put it that way, Mexico is still doing you know, really um, much worse in terms of daily deaths. Um, it, it's plateauing and with the risk of going up, um, whereas almost every other country in the region other than Argentina, and we'll see Argentina I think go down soon, has, has gone down significantly. So I, I think that that's just hugely important um, what Clive has signaled. And, uh, and yes, you know, it's easier to do it in a small, small island state or a small country, um, but it can be done at local levels as well. And uh, that's something that I think we need to think about um, for the small and larger countries of, of our, our region. Um, we, I'm so pleased with how the Q&A is going. This is actually the best Q&A we've had um, in all of our series on COVID-19 in the Americas. So I am going to keep going. Um, some are sending multiple questions from the same person, but I'm gonna try to go through those first question. So Tamar Heron asks, the Caribbean economies are heavily dependent on importation. Hence the path of return to sustained economic growth is highly dependent on the pace at which the pandemic is brought under control. What are some interim and long-term measures that can be implemented to activate effective economic growth in the Caribbean? Well, I'll say one thing is immediate policy change and sophistication of our, our, our financial systems as I've said earlier. Um, another thing is, a, is exactly what Professor Landis talked about. Uh, we need to really not market but implement that testing capacity to ensure that we allow person safety back in. But beyond that is the innovative and creative response. Um, that, is, that is very critical in us moving it forward. It's, we can no longer, for example, at the, and we can see it can happen at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine, for example, when there was a national shortage of ventilators, the will was there and, and, and they started moving towards that. There was a shortage of hand sanitizers, they moved towards that. There was a shortage of masks, they, they could have done it. And even the labs could have rapidly been deployed to actually get enough state to do 50 to 100 tests a day. So it's really, how do we engender that innovative response? How do we ensure that the innovative response can 
actually move to something entrepreneurial and beyond. We must not forget most of these economies, as he rightly brought up the issue of importation and export, were set up as hinterlands to basically deal with another motherland and, and hence we export and then we gain, gain things back and so on. And that model has not significantly changed over time, but to gain economies of scale and to, to deal with this, what we call the, the fourth industrial revolution, which, which we are in right now, um, the, the Caribbean needs to embrace the fourth industrial revolution and work towards economy, new economic mechanisms such as the circular economy, uh, where recycle, reduce, reuse also becomes important. So there, there are many avenues that, that they can use is which one is their one political will to do it. Um, and, and to put that in place is another question because the, a lot relies on the, the, the political will uh, within the system to, to move and transition to that sort of state because it, it will take some hard decisions. I wanted to just then go back to something we discussed a little bit earlier. I mean, all of the economics literature for decades has pointed to the fact that health begets wealth, right? Um, healthy people, but also places that promote good access to health, and in this case, safety, will have better and stronger economic growth. And I think that's what Clive is driving at, um, that if people know that this is a safe destination, they will go there. And, and historically, we've, we've seen that, that places that eradicate or control certain diseases that can affect people, help their local population, but also become then interesting and safe places for people to go. So this is a, you know, a classic example of how health begets wealth and investment in a good healthcare system is about investing in economic growth and development. I think that's huge. I wanted to throw a question to, to all three. I wonder if we could speak a little bit about mask wearing. So, um, you know, I, I've been, we've been very doubtful about the data that we're seeing for Latin America. Um, from Facebook and others showing extremely, you know, high rates of regular and persistent mask use. And, you know, my, my understanding of the science and the literature, we believe this very strongly, is that effective mask use and social distancing, which I prefer to call physical distancing, is really key to safety. But is it true, these extremely high rates of mask use that we're seeing, we're, we're doubting it from at least photographic evidence that we have for say Mexico, Brazil or other parts of Latin America. What is it like in the Caribbean? Oh, and has it been politicized? We have to I ask that like question. To, I, think as I well. would like to uh, take a stab at that. So uh, no, it has not been politicized. Um, so we have been following the evidence and the University of the West Indies, our task force, which I chair, uh, we're very, very fortunate that we have a bona fide coronavirus um, expert on our task force called Christopher Ora. Most of us have become sort of ESATS um, experts, but he really is one. <laughs> and um, so we produced an evidence, uh, an evidentiary review of all the evidence um, uh, on how the uh, virus is transmitted and everything. And uh, our opinion was that right from early, the evidence was quite clear that there's an incremental benefit um, in, in, in mask wearing and cutting down transmission. So it's not going to be um, like at the level of um, uh, a N95, you know, a PP, personal protective equipment, which you would need to have if you're a, a healthcare worker. It won't be 100%. However, there's an incremental benefit. And for that reason, we always recommended it. And in the Caribbean, um, uh, not many countries have have legislated that you must wear. However, the example has been set right from the top um, uh, all the way down that mask wearing is seen as being the right thing to do. And many of the businesses have just simply taken matters into their own hands and they've just said, uh, no mask, no service. So there has been um, very little resistance in the Caribbean to, to mask wearing. People are quite happy to, to comply because I think they can see that it's, it's going to, uh, it, you know, improve their health and protect them and others. Thanks. Can I just offer a, again, you know, from the sidelines, this is anecdotal um, and it's experiential. So it's based on my personal um, encounter with the mask. Um, so, so in the formal businesses, so in the formal places of commerce, you are 
everywhere required to wear your mask as well as get your hand sanitized. Although I recently saw something, I think it was in the New York Times that says there's no evidence that cleaning surfaces, and I guess maybe your hands are different, is actually, you know, like breaking the rate of spread of the virus. But, you know, I, I, maybe that doesn't apply to the hand washing. Uh, probably not. Because they say, it's, you know, it's airborne. Uh, but back back to what I was actually saying, um, the the idea that in the formal places of commerce and institutional um, sort of venues, you can't enter without your mask. And even at the university, everywhere you go, you're, you're so Clive, you're doing a good job on the campus. I, I find though that when you break from these kind of formal places and you're in your bubble or you're in your, your more sort of social context, that some somehow you know the burden of the mask wearing it somehow becomes un unbearable and and so I think it, except if you have a spike in the cases like in some islands they're experiencing spikes and so the governments are forcing you to wear masks more I find that there is a, a little bit sometimes of a disconnect between where you're formally wearing masks and I, I suspect this happens everywhere and in your more social context where you feel comfortable with the people around you. And so I'm wondering if, you know, there's anything to be said or done about that. But that's that's kind of my experience with the mask wearing in the region. Um, in, in countries, again, where it is, you're, you're witnessing a rise. Yes, countries are really wearing, um, forcing people to wear their masks, irrespective of whether it's social or, or formal. But in places, I think, where it's under control, I think we're, we can allow for a little bit more freedom, um, but being careful that we are entering a second lockdown. I don't know, Ma um, Dr. Maharaj, if you have a different... Yes. Trinidad, it's legislated, actually, mass use. Even if you're driving in the car, you need to wear your mask if there's another person in the car. If it's you alone, that's fine. So mass use is really uh, on top of the, the game here. Um, and I think Clive has said it right, there's a significant amount of evidence that has come, up, come out showing that it, it has some, some level of prevent, prevention, be it that you get a milder form of the virus or whatever. But the, the realities are, um, it is seen in this part of the world to be effective in, uh, and a useful tool in combating the, the virus. And um, as I said, we have legislated here and it's a serious fine if you, if you don't wear a mask, you're fined. I'm, I'm glad if I might add on this topic that they have uh, legislated uh, uh, for it in cars because, you know, you have to keep tracking um, which professions um, are at risk uh, of contracting due to their work. And across the world, taxi drivers are now considered to be amongst the absolutely the most exposed um, and at risk of catching COVID-19. So, you know, I think that's uh, certainly evidence-based. Yes, no, I, I have to agree on this front. And it's, uh, it may be somewhat uncomfortable sometimes, but it's one of those few interventions that really do not create harm um, to almost anyone. And so it's something that I, I have to agree, I think is extremely important and all the evidence suggests that we would see many fewer deaths in our world where they're more complete mask wearing and how important it is that the leaders of our countries and our communities keep their masks on and mask up so that others will, will do the same. Um, we are close to ending, but I wanted to, uh, let's see, read just the last questions, but I do wanna let us go at one other issue that someone asked. So let me just say there's a question, perhaps we can take it by writing in, were the restriction measures taken in Bahamas and Jamaica successful in terms of increasing local production? Um, there's another on remittances, um, and uh, there's one specifically around fabrics for masks. But what I wanted to, to get to in our just very last round is something around gender. One of the questions was asking, why would um, there be higher death rates or cases for women versus men? And uh, I think looking at some of the gender questions might be quite interesting because what we've seen in other countries is extremely low um, rates supposedly for women, but that's typically because they don't have access and they're not counted and they're not tested. So if we have differential rates in many parts of the world for testing, it's going to appear as though women are less affected than men when that is absolutely um, not the, the, the truth. And also to think about um, women, young mothers, um, middle-aged and older, 
as the caregivers um, and often devoid of any access to PPE. They are caring for those who are ill and they've been doing so for a long time in a completely unprotected way. So since there was a question about that, I could give a quick round of any thoughts around gender issues in, in the Caribbean and, and the battle against COVID in the future. Um, well, I would certainly want to add just briefly to that. Um, the, my, my real concern has to do with how uh, COVID-19 is, is, is uh, in a bigger way impacting women on their lives and, and livelihoods. So um, uh, women, uh, research all around the world has shown that women are more likely to lose their job first when COVID struck because they have the um, duties to look after children at home and when shutdowns happened or when schools closed, they were needed at home. And secondarily, they're less likely to take up their employment again because again of these conflicting um, uh, requirements at, at home. So uh, there is no question that women have been um, uh, impacted more severely and certainly in the Caribbean um, on the point of view of livelihoods. Um, I don't really know whether we have very good statistics on comparative death rates. Um, uh, the numbers are relatively low in each country. Um, I haven't uh, seen anything um, that goes much beyond what has been reported elsewhere, like in China and New York and, and um, uh, Italy, that it tends to be a, a slightly higher ratio of men who are dying rather than females, but um, there could be difficulties with data. I've, thank you for that. And oh, I'm sorry, Sandy, did you want to, to add something to that? No, it's basically what Prof. Landis said. The, the statistics here are not much different from the world. Um, statistics from what I have seen. And if I can turn that the infection rate among women is slightly more, but the death rate among men is slightly more. And that that's that's basically what we're seeing. But when it comes to disease state, however, it's not gender. We're clearly seeing persons with comorbidities, NCDs, uh, 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 do not have a very good outcome there. Right, hugely important set of, of last messages around, I think, um, issues of prevention as well. There are just certain good practices. Um, hand washing is a good practice all around, always. Um, not smoking, doing exercise, and there are ways to do that even when you're under lockdown. Um, a good healthy diet and an appropriate weight for height. All of those are wonderful ways to protect yourself from, from COVID and many other um, diseases that are, are rampant throughout uh, the Caribbean and other parts of our world. I want to thank all three of you, Clive, Janiv, and Sandeep for an amazing webinar. I think this is one of the um, most um, interesting set of discussions, certainly wonderful set of questions, but it is just testament to the um, level of, of scholarship um, in so many disciplines that those of us who know the University of the West Indies know is, is the case. And the University of Miami is so happy to be able to partner um, directly with the University of the West Indies and, and also through our Hemispheric University Consortium. So um, on the COVID front, may this be the first of many future collaborations. I know there are many others that are ongoing between our universities. Um, I want to take a moment to thank the university, as well as each of you, um, to also thank our um, incredible student who works with us on translation, Leila Clower, who's always there in the background, helping us to make sure that we can reach out to our region. And I want to thank our University of Miami Institute for Advanced Study of the Americas staff, all who participated in making this possible, as well as those from the University of Miami who make this possible, like Brandon, like Jeff, Dory, Michael, and, uh, and, and many others. And then finally, a, a last thank you. So the chair of our advisory committee of our institute is Sir George Elaine. And one of the reasons why we have such a close bond with the University of the West Indies, with Barbados and with, with the region is because of our, our incredible debt to, to Sir George, who's also got an honorary doctorate from our university. So I could not help but give a shout out and, and thank you for all the support in so many ways that this co collaboration is meant for our institute and for our university. Um, our uh, recording of this webinar, as I said, will be up very, very soon on our University of Miami Institute for Advanced Study of the Americas website, located at mia.as.miami.edu. 
www.ucsd.edu. And your questions and, and other thoughts, we'd be pleased to see them via Twitter or at our website. Please feel free to contact us and I'm sure our panelists will be ongoing with collaborative research and projects in the future. And we will be in touch about our future webinars in this series um, of our Observatory of COVID in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you again to all and have a wonderful afternoon. Um, evening or morning, depending on where you are in the world. And please keep safe, be healthy, and be blessed. Thank you so much, Felicia. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. I, I, I look forward to all sorts of future collaboration. I, I really do. Um, we shall many, do that. many opportunities. Yes, Clive, thank you. It was amazing. All right. I know you have other things to go to. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.